Welcome back to Hardware Unbox for our official Ryzen 3 coverage. At this point, you probably know just about everything there is to know about the Ryzen 3 1300X and 1200, with that little exception of exactly how they perform and, of course, the price. That being the case, I'm going to jump right into the benchmarks of this one. I'm also going to be looking at overclocking performance throughout the benchmarks, and then towards the end of the video, I'll show you just how well these Ryzen 3 CPUs overclock using the Wraith Stealth Box Cooler when we look at things such as temperatures. Speaking of overclocking, the Ryzen 3 1200 hit 3.9 GHz using the Box Cooler, while the 1300X did slightly better hitting 4 GHz. So without any further ado, let's get to it. First up, memory performance, and here are a few quick notes before we get into it. When I put together my Ryzen 3 simulator video, I used DDR4-2933 memory, with SMT disabled on the Ryzen 5 1400, and I noted that it was unlikely that the Ryzen 3 CPUs would be able to run with higher frequency memory. So far, this has indeed been the case, as neither the 1300X nor the 1200 would post using DDR4-3200 via the XMP setting. So I was forced to run DDR4-2933, and this was also the case with my Ryzen 5 1500X and 1400 CPUs. Nonetheless, performance was decent, and we saw over 34GB per second of memory bandwidth, and that figure was boosted to around 35.5GB per second once the CPUs were overclocked. Moving on, we have the first CPU-related benchmark, and here the Ryzen 3 1200 shows fairly weak single-thread performance, coupled with reasonably decent multi-threaded performance. The higher-clocked 1300X made out a bit better, matching a single-thread performance of the Core i5-7500, with slightly weaker multi-threaded performance. Overclocked, both Ryzen 3 CPUs achieved similar scores as they are both now running at similar frequencies. Both are faster than the Core i5-7500 for both the single and multi-threaded tests. For those interested in compression and decompression work, we have 7-zip, and here the 1200 was a good bit faster than the Pentium G4560, but slower than the Core i3-7350K. The 1300X was much more impressive as it beat the 7350K and edged out the i5-7500. That said though, once overclocked, both Ryzen 3 CPUs sat comfortably ahead of the Core i5-7500. Moving on from compression work, we have spreadsheet performance with Microsoft Excel 2016. Here the 1300X did very well matching the lower clocked 1400, meanwhile the 1200 did trail the i3-7500K, but it was much faster than the G4560. Overclocked, we squeezed a little more out of the Ryzen 3 CPUs, but even so, the 1300X still trailed the i5-7500 by a small margin. Moving on, we have the first of four PC Mark 10 test suites that we're going to look at. The data here is arranged by the video conferencing results, and here the Ryzen 3 CPUs slot in between the Pentium G4560 and Core i3-7350K. Meanwhile, once overclocked, they moved ahead of the Core i5-7500. The productivity test has been arranged by the spreadsheet results, and here the Ryzen 3 CPUs sit at the bottom of our graph behind the G4560. Overclocked though, they did make up some considerable ground in this test, and they're now able to match the Ryzen 5 1600X and Core i5-7500, so quite an extreme recovery there. This graph has been arranged by the photo editing result, and here the Ryzen 3 CPUs do very well. The 1300X was almost able to match the Core i5-7500, and once overclocked, both the 1200 and 1300X pulled ahead, and now are delivering 1500X-like performance. Finally, we have the video editing test, and here the Ryzen 3 1200 was slightly faster than the G4560, while the 1300X sat between the i5-7500 and i3-7350K. The higher clocked Core i3 CPU was the faster of the two, overclocking boosted performance significantly, and we are now seeing Core i7 7700K like performance in this test, so very impressive stuff there. Moving on from PC Mark 10, we have the Corona benchmark, and here the Ryzen 3 1200 wasn't much faster than the G4560. Thankfully, though, the 1300X was a good bit faster and even managed to beat the i3-7350K. In fact, it wasn't much slower than the quad-core i5-7500. Overclocking, unfortunately, didn't help improve the 1300's score by a noteworthy margin, though it was now faster than the i5-7500 as was the 1200, so a good result for the budget Ryzen 3 CPUs nonetheless. The Ryzen 3 1200 isn't much slower than the i3-7350K in Blender. Meanwhile, the 1300X was faster than the Core i3-7350K, but it was also much slower than the i5-7500. Unfortunately, overclocked, the 1300X was only able to match the i5-7500. I had expected, given the stock performance, that it would pull ahead here, but as I said, unfortunately, 
that wasn't the case. Moving on to Handbrake, the Ryzen 3 CPUs beat Intel's Pentium and Core i3 range, but even overclocked, didn't have enough in the tank to match the Core i5 series. For content creators on a budget, the Ryzen series looks to be a godsend, especially once overclocked. Stock the 1200 roughly matched the i3 7350K, while the 1300X sat between the 7350K and i5 7500. Overclocked though, the 1300X beats the i5-7500 and isn't that much slower than the Ryzen 5 1400. So a great result in Premiere Pro CC. Moving on, it's now time for some games. Please note though, I have dropped Mafia 3. The game's been hugely inconsistent over the past few months and another new recent patch has again changed things for Ryzen. I'm now seeing much better performance from Ryzen, similar to what I was seeing many months ago when Ryzen was first released, but the game has some other performance glitches that were quite annoying during testing, so rather than waste any more time with this title, I'm dumping it for good. So here we have Battlefield 1 and some very interesting results indeed. Please note I am using a high-end GPU at 1080p but plan to release a more in-depth gaming focus video soon using a range of GPUs, so hang tight for that one. Anyway, as I said, these results as they stand are very interesting. Out of the box, the Ryzen 3 CPUs do do very well here, particularly when looking at the minimum frame rate, which is considerably better than that of Intel's dual-core hyper-threading enabled G4560 and 7350K. Overclocked, the Ryzen 3 CPUs are able to match the Core i5-7500, which is an exceptional result. Moving on to Hitman, we do again see very strong gaming performance for Ryzen 3. Here both the 1200 and 1300 easily beat the G4560 while they are roughly on par with the i5-7500. Once overclocked, they're able to overtake the 7500 and deliver a similar experience to the SMT-enabled quad-core 1400 and 1500X CPUs. Finishing up the gaming benchmarks, we have Ashes of the Singularity, and here we have some slightly disappointing results. It would seem the lack of SMT support here really hurts Ryzen 3 in this title. Even overclocked, the Ryzen 3 CPUs were quite a bit slower than the Core i5-7500 and their SMT-enabled quad-core parts. Now, onto power consumption. The Ryzen 3 1200, thanks to its relatively low clock speeds, was very light on the go juice, pushing total system consumption to just 87 watts in our Excel test. The 1300X was quite a bit hungrier, considerably more than you would expect based on the results seen by the 1200. Although the 1200 is clocked 8-10% to lower, total system consumption was more like 26% lower. The reason for this being that my ASRock board was running the R3 1200 at a much lower voltage than the 1300X, and this really helps reduce consumption. Overclocked though, they were much similar, but again I was able to hit 3.9GHz using much less voltage than it took to push the 1300X to 4GHz. The Cinebench R15 power consumption results are more what I was expecting to see. That said, the 1200 is still consuming around 17% less power when comparing total system figures. This placed the 1200 on par with the i3 7350K and i5 7500. Once overclocked though, I have to say consumption was still very tame, and the 1300X for example only pushed total system consumption to 120 watts. Okay, so that concludes the power consumption testing, moving on to the temperatures. Now for this testing, I used the Wraith Stealth box cooler exclusively, as I feel this option makes the most sense for these budget coolers. That said though, there are $20 options which will enable lower temperatures, so be sure to keep that in mind. Anyway, out of the box, the 1300X peaked at 62 degrees when stressing the CPU, FPU and cache. The 1200 hit just 55 degrees, so that was a very impressive result indeed. That said, if we stressed just the CPU, which I feel is probably a more realistic stress test, the 1300X maxed out at just 49 degrees and the 1200 hit just 42 degrees. For a box cooler under heavy load, they are simply amazing results. Moving to the overclocking results, let's look at the 1200 first. Again, idle temperatures were in the low 30s, stressing the CPU saw temps max out at just 52 degrees, while stressing the FPU and cache saw temps touch on 72 degrees, though for the most part they did sit around 67 degrees. I was also still using the default fan curve here, and I would describe the Wraith Stealth as a very quiet cooler, which is probably the most shocking part. 
Now, the slightly higher clocked 1300x at 4 GHz with that additional voltage required the fan speed to be maxed out. That said, even at full speed, spinning at 2600 RPM, the Wraith Stealth isn't hideously loud. Stressing just the CPU saw temperatures hit 63 degrees, which is very manageable. That said, stressing both the FPU and cache saw peaks of around 92 degrees, though keep in mind for the most part the system did sit at around 83 degrees, which is much more acceptable. So all in all, some incredibly good results from the Wraith Stealth box cooler when overclocking these Ryzen 3 CPUs. Before wrapping things up, let's take a quick look at a few price versus performance scatter plots. Now, please note we are just comparing CPU prices here. This doesn't take into account additional costs like the need for a cooler for Intel's K series, for example. Well, this graph is quite telling, isn't it? For those of you wondering what you're looking at, uh, the further to the right the plots, the better uh, the performance, and the lower the plots, the better the price. So basically, you want to be situated as far right as possible and as low as possible. Doing just that is the overclocked R3 1200. The 1200 wasn't much slower than the Core i5 7500, while costing almost half as much. Meanwhile, it's still cheaper than the i3 7350K, but much faster when comparing the minimum frame rate. The overclocked 1300X was slightly faster, but also more expensive. There isn't much in it, but the 1200 is still the better value choice here. Moving on to handbrake, we see that the scatter plot is again dominated by red dots in all the right spots. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, Intel does put up more of a fight this time, but for quite a bit less than the Core i3-7350K, the Ryzen 3 1200 delivers a smidgen more performance. Overclock the 1200 pulls ahead of the i3-7350K. Of course, you can overclock the Intel chip, but once you factor in the price of a motherboard with an overclocking enabled chipset and a cooler, the price versus performance ratio turns to the stuff Intel uses as a TIM. <laughs> Lastly, we have Premiere Pro CC, and here the red team comes out in force. It's all rising here. Stock the R3 1200 isn't particularly impressive, but once you overclock, things change rapidly. For example, the render times. Overclocked, it's not much slower than the Core i5 7500, and of course, at almost half the price, that's a very solid result. Looking at this scatter plot, it's pretty clear for content creators, Ryzen is a bit of a good thing. Okay, time to wrap things up. So last week we checked out simulated Ryzen 3 performance using the R5 1400 with SMT disabled and a few minor adjustments to the operating clock speeds. At the time we were working on the assumption that the leaked pricing info was correct, which would see the R3 1200 priced at $110 US, with the R3 1300X coming in at $130 US. And as it turns out, those figures were indeed correct. Based on previous findings, I noted that Ryzen 3 looked as though it was going to be a decent proposition, but wasn't overly excited by what I saw. Yes, in terms of value, it beats out the locked Core i5s, and for that matter, the entire Core i3 range. But when compared to the SMT-enabled Ryzen 5 quad core, such as the 1400 and 1500X, I felt like spending a little more to receive all eight threads was probably going to be the smarter move for most. However, we've now got all the facts at hand. Previously, I wasn't sure on things such as the cooler that would be included in the package and what kind of overclocking headroom we could expect to see from these budget processors. As it turns out, we get the nice little Wraith Stealth and as we saw, that does a commendable job and it allowed us to hit 3.9 GHz on the 1200 and 4 GHz on the 1300X. The fact that these overclocks were achieved using nothing more than the humble box cooler is nothing short of amazing, and it certainly adds a lot of value to these chips, especially when you consider the Core i3-7350K doesn't come with a cooler at all, and it currently retails for $150 US. So the Ryzen 3 1300X and 1200 are the obvious choice over the dual-core Core i3-7350K, a CPU no one should have been buying anyway, especially at the $150 US asking price, and this in my opinion is kind of the problem Ryzen 3 faces. While superior in terms of value, it's beating an already beaten lineup. From this point forward, I'll largely be regurgitating the conclusion from my Ryzen 3 simulator video, a few notes here and there, but overall, the same message. So here we go. Even today in mid-2017, if I wanted to build an affordable brand new computer, the Pentium G4560 still puts forward a strong case. That is assuming you can get one for the MSRP of $64 US. It enables playable performance in all the latest titles using an entry-level or mid-range graphics card, and on top of that, it's super efficient. However, 
Having said that, locally here in Australia, it's currently out of stock everywhere I checked, and in the US, major retailers such as Amazon, Newegg, and Superbiz, for example, are all showing no stock. At the time of putting this video together, P&H Photo had stock, but we're asking $80 US, and that's a 25% markup over the MSRP. So I feel like the Intel Pentium G4600 is the new budget choice from Intel, and that's currently selling for a way, way less attractive $87 US. At that price for me, it's no doubt going to be Ryzen 3 1200 all day. Ignoring Intel's lineup, which to be honest, you really safely can do at these price points, the Ryzen 5 1400 1500X seem like the obvious choice. And yet if you were really serious about your PC, I would recommend save a little extra cash and get the six core R5 1600 and call it a day. My reason for saying this is because if you went for the cheapest possible gaming rebuild with a basic B350 board, 8GB of DDR4 memory, a cheap case and power supply combo, the GeForce GTX 1050, and something like a 500GB Seagate Fire CUDA SSHD, you'd save just 18% on the entire build when opting for the R3 1200 over the R5 1600. You'd be getting half as much level 3 cache, 2 less cores, and 8 less threads. For those wondering, the same system would be just 10% cheaper with the R3 1200, opposed to the SMT-enabled R5 1400, so again, spending a little more does seem to get you a lot more in this case. Still, if you're hell-bent on spending as little as possible, the Ryzen 3 1200, just $110 US, is a super chip. Given that the 1300X did only produce an additional 100 megahertz overclock over the 1200, and I feel like that's probably a best case scenario, I don't feel like spending an additional $20 is worth it. Just get the base model 1200 would be my advice. Overclock the 1200 is a ripper, often delivering 1500X like performance in games. Of course, you can overclock the 1500X for even more performance, but that's beside the point. Well, kind of. Uh, at almost half the price of the Core i5 7500, the overclocked R3 1200 obviously represents insane value, and gamers can look forward to a similar level of performance. Anyway, wrapping things up, I'd again conclude by saying that. The only real issue for the Ryzen 3 lineup is AMD's own Ryzen 5 lineup. Uh, the Ryzen 5s are just so strong in terms of value. That said though, I am keen to do further testing as I always am. Uh, I think one cool test would be to take the R3 1200, clock it at 3.9 GHz as we did in this very video, and compare it to the R5 1400 at the same 3.9 GHz, and then compare them in a huge range of games using a mid-range graphics card to see just how much difference there really is. Of course, as I just said, there is much more testing to be done. I have a few more ideas I would like to do. And I know for some of you, uh, this day one review would have left a bit to be desired and would have liked to see a few more testing and some mid-range GPUs in the mix and stuff like that. But there just really honestly isn't time to get that much testing done for these day one reviews. Uh, they're pretty much rushed as it is. So I want to touch on things like thermals, power consumption, overclocking, and all that kind of important stuff and then follow up later with more in-depth benchmarking videos, which is what I plan to do. I would like to do a video where I compare quite a few relevant CPUs with a range of GPUs at a few resolutions in a heap of games. So that in itself is going to take a lot of time. Um, but possibly uh, something I'm even more keen to do is an upgrader's guide where I'll include something like the Sandy Bridge i5 2500K and the FX8350, for example. I think that would be a really cool video. But anyway, I'm going to end this one here. If you like the video, you know what to do. Hit the like button for us. It really helps us out. Subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notification bell to put yourself in contention to make that all-important first comment. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon, guys.